Skyborne, Episode 17, Broken, by K.G. Lockrams. As I drove away, sobbing, I had no idea what to do or where to go. I must have been in some kind of fugue state. When I came back to myself, I was parked in the gravel driveway alongside Ginger's house. I could hear my mother's voice in my head. You were the joy of my life. You make me sick. I wish you were dead. When you're dying of AIDS, don't come crying to me. I won't be there for you. My mother had cursed me with a death from AIDS. I was abandoned. Both my parents had ultimately rejected me. I felt unlovable, utterly disposable, and broken. I knew she would have a hard time with the news, given the two conversations we'd had around the holidays. The first when she'd found my letter to Paul, in which I wrote that I was gay and the second when she sat down with me in the kitchen and told me I was confused. I had written her a letter saying that if she couldn't accept me, she'd lose me. It was as much a bluff as anything else. Never had I imagined I'd be thrown out, disowned, and wished dead by my mother. The world was swirling in the mystery of AIDS. People's opinions were formed and driven by fear, ignorance, and blatant disinformation from conservatives and the religious right. The healthcare community was unable to do any better than temporarily stabilize a patient with the disease until the next opportunistic disease attacked, and then the next, and the next. Until the person's body lost its battle and succumbed to the series of diseases. AIDS was always in the back of my mind as I came to terms with my sexuality. By 1988, almost 55,000 Americans had died from complications due to AIDS, It was spreading so quickly the Surgeon General, himself a conservative, mailed a pamphlet to every household in America to raise awareness about AIDS and how it was transmitted. It was the single largest government mailing in American history and focused on the primary ways AIDS was transmitted. Tainted blood supply, anal sex, and shared needles. I never saw that pamphlet. My mother, the nurse, disposed of it immediately, I'm sure. AIDS had originally been positioned as a gay cancer, as if it were spontaneously generated within one's body as a byproduct of being homosexual. If you were gay, then you were going to die from AIDS. During the time when it was thought to only affect the gay community, the mainstream media didn't much care about it and furthered that disinformation or supplied no information at all. Christian conservatives said it was God's wrath, a punishment for the sin of homosexuality. Then, straight people, children, and beloved actors, performers, and athletes began contracting and dying from AIDS and its many complications, and suddenly mainstream America cared about them. AIDS kills fags dead, and good riddance. I lived in constant fear of AIDS. First, I lived in fear it would spontaneously develop within my body when I realized in high school I was probably gay. Then the fear of having gotten it from Pip when he raped me, a fear as traumatizing to me as the rape itself. And although I never did anything with Michael that wasn't considered to be safe at the time, the concern of catching it was always in the back of my mind, all because it was originally positioned as inevitable. To have my mother speak into words my worst fear, that I would die of AIDS, was the most traumatic experience of my life. In under three minutes, my mother said the most horrible things any living being had ever said to me. I truly felt as if I had been cursed. The kitchen door opened. Kit, is that you? I was sitting behind the wheel, the engine running, staring straight ahead in stasis. Ginger knocked gently on my car window. I turned toward her, tears streaming down my face. Oh my, she said and opened my car door. I just looked at her. Come inside. I followed her into her kitchen by the looks of things they had just finished Easter dinner. My mom is here. She's in the living room. Go have a seat. I took off my jacket and did as instructed. Honey, what's wrong? Grace asked. My mom, I began and then started crying so hard I couldn't say another word. Ginger came into the room and gave me a glass of ice water and a box of tissues. Do you want me to tell my mom what's been going on? Ginger asked. I nodded my head and wiped the tears from my eyes as Ginger walked Grace through my journey to date, from first telling Ginger I thought I was gay, through coming out to my friends at school, 
and how they'd all turned their backs on me. Grace put her hand on her heart and gave me a loving smile. I take it there's been a new development, Ginger stated as fact. In between bouts of tears, I told them what had just happened. I can't believe my own mother would wish me dead. And from AIDS. Oh, honey, Grace said, leaning toward me in her chair. No mother should speak such hurtful words to their child. Do you think she'll calm down? Ginger asked. She's had years to prepare for this. She first asked me if I was a faggot when I was in eighth grade. She cannot unspeak her words. I never told Ginger about what had happened between my father and I in eighth grade. Both she and Grace exchanged confused glances as to why a parent would ask their child such a thing at such an age, but they let it be. She said to me that life was hard enough without being gay, and then she chose in that moment to make it as hard for me as she possibly could. Tears welled up in my eyes. What do you need? Grace asked. I have no idea. There was nothing to say or do, and so we sat quietly until I got myself together and stood to leave. What are you going to do? Grace asked. Go back to campus. There's nothing else to do. I have to keep moving or I'm afraid I won't ever move again. Can I give you a hug, honey? Grace asked. I nodded yes. As she hugged me, she whispered in my ear, You're such a dear young man. Don't let your mother's poison into your heart. She gave me a final squeeze and released me. When I got back to school, Ray was not in the room. He had just turned 21. I assumed he was off getting wasted somewhere. He was around less and less each week. I called Paul to see if he had any words of advice, but he wasn't home. I didn't bother to leave a message. I would have just started to cry again, and I was tired of crying. I looked around the empty room and thought how much had changed in the short time since we'd moved in. There was a box of spiced wafer cookies on Ray's desk. That fall, before he'd broken up with his last girlfriend, We used to eat our way through a box of them together while drinking beer. I got up, picked up the box, threw it in the trash, and crawled into bed. My mother's words played on a loop as hot tears ran down my face and onto my pillow. I was exhausted. I met Joy for coffee and a muffin that Tuesday morning, as was our tradition. You're awfully quiet today, she said. I was trying to decide how much I wanted to tell her. I didn't have the best weekend. Easter dinner? Your family is challenging from what I've put together over the last few years. My mother told me I wasn't welcome in her home anymore, so I've got to figure out what that looks like going forward. Oh, Kit, she said and went to put her hand on mine, but stopped herself. She was always conscious of not crossing the line from friendship to mothering. What are you going to do? I don't know. I looked her in the eyes and could feel the tears begin to well, so I looked away. I stared out the glass front of the building as I said, I'll stay on campus for as long as I can. I'll focus on school, and I'll figure the rest out as it comes. We were both quiet. I can't imagine ever doing that to any of my children. I looked back at her. I can't imagine you ever doing that either. Until two days ago, I couldn't imagine my own mother doing that. In my wildest dreams, I never saw that coming. I'm such an idiot. You are not an idiot she said firmly. Expecting love from your parents should be a given. Can I ask what happened? I looked at the clock and used the time to evade her question. We'd better get going, or we'll be late to class. She gave me a look that said, I know what you're doing right now, but she let it go. I was in my dorm room for the night when the phone rang. Hello? It was my brother. This was the first time in her life he had ever called me. I'd written my dorm number in the letter I'd given him on Easter. You've really upset Mom with this stunt. She's been crying ever since. He sounded happy about it. It's not a stunt. Well, whatever. Personally, I don't care what you are. I was surprised by his attitude. Just as I thought that perhaps some positive change between my brother and I could come out of this, he said, Oh, I told Dad. He said to tell you he always knew you'd be a faggot. And he hung up the phone. I could hear the smug satisfaction in his voice at being able to deliver that message to me. My cheek under my right eye started to clench, and I began to shake. I could feel myself slipping into depression. I was literally all alone. No pack of friends. No Ray. 
and as was my habit, I was turning all of my anger and fear inward on myself. My fear of being completely unlovable had been specifically confirmed by my mother and my father. The things my inner voice was saying to me were not helpful, yet felt absolutely true. You are broken. You are such an idiot. You were so fucking naive. You're useless. So fucking useless. You're unlovable. No one loves you. Even you don't love you. A couple of days later, there was a note in Ray's handwriting on my desk. Call your sister, it read. That night I called my sister. Mom is really upset, she started. I didn't say anything. I doubted her mother had told her what she had said to me, and if I told her, she would say, Mom wouldn't say that, and I didn't have it in me to fight with her. I read your letter, and... I guess my only problem with your being gay is that it's an affront against God and nature. I was momentarily stunned into silence. My sister hadn't set foot in a church outside of Christmas for the singing since she was 15, and then I was pissed. At least it isn't a mortal sin, I shot back. I beg your pardon? Isn't Manny married? He's getting a divorce, she said defensively. No, he told you he's going to get a divorce. He hasn't even filed yet, which means you're having an affair with a married man. And the last time I checked, adultery is a mortal sin. She slammed the phone down. I did the same. As much as I would have loved to have had her as an ally, her choice to embrace a faux spirituality to further denigrate me while she was having an affair with a married man was too much to swallow. My brother's lack of interest was most surprising to me. I didn't really care about his opinion, but I felt a fool for having had a second of hope that maybe we'd be able to connect in some new way going forward. Sharing our father's reaction with me was unnecessarily hurtful. My brother was as spiteful a man as he had been a child, and there was a lifetime of hurtful actions between us. I always knew he'd be a faggot. My father used to tell me a story as a child of how my mother originally wanted to name me something else, but he wouldn't allow it. Absolutely not, he told her. The only person I knew with that name was a faggot. Is that irony? I honestly didn't know which way my sister would land. We'd never talked about homosexuality. The closest we ever came to the topic was when Liberace died a couple of years earlier. There was some story about him through our mother's side of the family, and the conversation turned away from AIDS and toward that, though my mother didn't miss the opportunity to speculate that he was probably a faggot. I had hoped my sister's current situation with Manny would have somehow softened her heart as she was living outside normal conventions, but clearly I was wrong. She had somehow managed to find the nexus of self-righteous Christian and adulterous. And my mother... I can recall with perfect clarity that Saturday morning in 8th grade, when she called me upstairs in the basement where my sister and I had been watching television, to ask me if I was a faggot. That should have told me all I needed to know about how her reaction would play out. If you are, we can get you fixed. I felt so stupid for believing that perhaps her divorce, which had come at a time when there was still a social stigma around it, could have fueled some personal growth or softened her heart. I should have known better. I had simply hoped motherhood would win out over hatefulness. How hard must a mother's heart be to wish her own son dead for telling her the truth about himself? In her mind, it was a reflection on her parenting. How could you do this to me? My brother and sister had told me over and over I'd be dead before my 21st birthday, and at 21, my mother was first in line to wish me dead for a whole new reason. Spring break came. I spent it between an empty campus and visiting Paul. He wasn't much help. His parents hadn't taken the news well when he came out, but he had waited until he was financially independent and out on his own before telling them. He'd also come out before AIDS existed. I was all the more thankful for having my car, free and clear, thanks to my grandmother's generosity and kindness. Don't tell your grandmother. It would kill her. I was slipping into an emotional tailspin. My life felt fractured and disconnected from reality. All I had keeping me off the streets was my scholarship and the remaining two months of school. And then what? I asked myself. Where will I live come summer? You make me sick. I wish you were dead. I spent a great deal of time after Easter wishing I was dead too. What was I fighting for? 
As I worked harder to be my true self, I was met with more rejection, more heartache, and more pain. I felt my coming out had been a mistake. My heart was in the right place. I did it for the right reasons, to be true to myself and to be in the world as my true self. But I was naive, for believing being ethical would somehow equate to being supported. I was wrong. I was equally incapable of having been any other way or having made any other decision. I hated lying. I hated hiding. I couldn't decide which was the harder price to pay. Years of living a lie and the toll that took on my spirit and would continue to take throughout my lifetime, or coming out and losing everything and most everyone. I concluded if my own family wouldn't support my being gay, no school system would either. People were terrified of AIDS, and by extension, gay men. Gay men were also widely believed to be pedophiles. I didn't have it in me to go back into the closet. Coming out had cost me too much, and I was not going to yield any of the ground I'd gained as I discovered and revealed my true self. When you're dying of AIDS, don't come crying back to me. I won't be there for you. My time in college was over. I stopped trying to fit into a career I felt didn't want me in the first place and stopped going to both math classes. My higher reasoning had left the building after Easter. I stopped seeing Julio. Our first session after he'd read my letter to Violet was disturbing, and I was too fragile to risk facing that version of him again. Cruising men's rooms for sex? No thanks. I wasn't looking for a death sentence. Didn't my parents teach me any morals? Compared to my family and the pack of friends who had collectively turned their backs on me, I felt my morals were just fine. I was grateful for his insight about my being somebody. It lit a small flame deep inside me that helped me through what had become a dark time. But overall, that counseling experience wasn't as safe, consistent, or nurturing as I needed it to be. I could have asked for another counselor, but I didn't have any fight left in me. I became resentful of my parents for having put the expectation on me that college was mandatory, then refusing to help me pay for it, then ultimately rejecting me when I was doing my best to follow the path they had laid out for me. I had five courses that semester. The two math classes I hadn't made it through last fall, a writing course for teachers, an introductory course to special education, and social dance for my phys ed requirement. I had signed up for the social dance class on a whim. I thought it would make for good stories. I couldn't walk across a room without tripping, but I could glide across the dance floor. I needed something that came easily, and it made me happy. I think that class saved my life. The dance instructor was a woman in her 50s and instantly took a liking to me. She taught two three-hour classes each week and approached me to be her teacher's aide in her second class. I said yes, because her other aide, Steve, had a nice ass and I had the hots for him. Nice ass or not, I enjoyed being in his company, and hers. For the remainder of the semester, I had six hours a week of foxtrots, waltzes, polkas, sambas, and hustles. For six hours a week, I was fully present within myself and with those around me, and I wasn't worried about a goddamn thing. That class brought me joy and positive reinforcement that I was good at something unexpected. I tried to make my peace with losing friends as a result of having come out. Ginger and Don, my other friend from junior college with bipolar disorder, were my only two friends who took the news in stride. For completeness, I wrote to Carrie in Scotland. I needed to know who my true friends were and no longer had the energy to waste pretending I was anything other than who I was. I wrote to her that I was gay and shared with her what had happened at college and with my family as I let people know. I told her I understood if her religious convictions prevented her from being happy for me. I said I hoped we could remain friends and wished her well. I never got a response. Ray was still MIA. I had purchased a guidebook on winter break about backpacking across Canada. It sat on my desk, half read. Clearly that wasn't going to happen. I picked it up to throw it in the trash, but my hopefulness kept me from doing it, and I slipped it into a drawer instead. I had heard Jonah needed a ride home one weekend, and being appreciative of doing his best to stay neutral, I offered him a lift. He didn't want anyone to think he was gay for accepting a ride from me. His rejection was surprisingly painful. He was one of my earliest crushes, and life somehow kept us together for almost seven years through high school, work, and college. And then there were none. 
Jenna was the last of my childhood friends to turn away from me. I kept up with the writing class, largely because it was effortless. I kept at the special ed course, too. It was heavy in psychology, which had always interested me. I was tempted to stop going to classes and get a job while living on campus, but some part of me said I could always use the credit somewhere else someday. I chose to take from my remaining college experience what I could. I saw Michael only two more times as his whatever I was. The first was for sex, because I needed some validation. The second was to say goodbye. I had overstayed my welcome, and Michael had moved on to new and shinier toys, one of whom was my pastor's son, Ken. It wasn't so much an affair, Michael explained, as a goodbye fuck. Ken is being deployed, and he wanted to give me a parting gift, so I unwrapped it. How was it? I asked. Exactly what I needed. You two always did have chemistry. He made it clear it was a one-time thing. He says he's straight, but was curious about it, and since we connect on so many levels, he felt I was the right one to explore with. There was no formal declaration of the ending between us. I knew I wouldn't be calling him again, and given he never initiated contact, when I let go, that would be the end of our affair. I went to my first gay bar. There had been one not far from my home growing up, but it closed before I turned 21 and had reopened as a hot dog place. This bar was about a half an hour from campus and was called The Unicorn. I sat in my car in the parking lot for about 20 minutes as I worked up the courage to go inside. It was a weeknight. The only people there were the bartender, a guy in his 60s, and me. I ordered a beer. First time at a gay bar? The bartender asked me. Yes. It shows. Relax. It's a work night. I didn't understand the work night comment. As he gave me my beer, he called out to the other guy. Only old queens come here on a work night. Stuff it, Tony, the man called back. You wish. I stayed long enough to finish my beer and left. I went back a couple more times on different nights of the week. Weekends were the busiest with the most diverse crowd. I kept to the corners and the walls and just observed. I couldn't imagine going up to a stranger and introducing myself. I'd hit my rejection limit. I scheduled an AIDS test at a clinic near the campus after knowing I wouldn't be seeing Michael again. At the time, if exposed, it took six months to show up in your blood work, and I hadn't been tested since my rape. Although Michael and I had always been safe, it seemed the responsible thing to do, and I wanted a baseline. When you're dying of AIDS, don't come crying back to me. At the clinic, there was a packet for enrolling in a gay dating service. I took one with me and sent in my check along with a bubble sheet with all the details about myself and what I was looking for in someone else. A couple of weeks later, I got my mail from the campus post office, and there was a set of matches from the dating site. I had just finished reading through the five matches when the phone rang. Hey, Ginger, I answered. You know when you do that, it's unnerving as hell, don't you? Yeah, but I love it when it works. There's a very small number of people calling me these days, so the odds were in my favor. Plus, I knew it was you. How are you holding up? Okay, all things considered. I have no friends here. I spend way too much time alone, worrying about literally everything. I've stopped seeing Michael. I've been to my first gay bar. And I just got a series of matches from a gay dating service. Wow, busy boy. I wanted to call and wish you good luck on your finals. Thanks, but I've decided I won't be coming back. I'm sorry to hear that. I know how much college means to you. Does it? Doesn't it? she said back. I don't know whose life I'm trying to live anymore. I stopped going to both math classes, so there'll be no scholarship next year. She stayed quiet and waited me out. It's for the best. I don't want to be a teacher if I can't be who I am. I don't want to be anything if I can't be who I am. Coming out has cost me too much to settle for less. If only your mother hadn't kicked you out. If wishes were horses, all beggars would ride, I said. What? Oh, it's something my father would say anytime we said we wished for something to be different than it was. It's just, I've taken the if-only scenarios as far as they can go. I am where I am, and it is what it is. I was totally faking my level of cool and acceptance of things. Internally, I was terrified and clueless. What are you going to do when you have to move out of the dorms? I honestly have no idea. Find someone looking for a roommate and get a job, I guess. I could use a roommate. Really? I'm taking on a new role at work, and I'll be required to travel most days. I have Misty. Misty was her cat. 
and I'll need someone to look out for her. Plus, it would give me peace of mind to have someone in the house while I'm out of town. I wouldn't be able to pay you much. I don't have a job lined up yet. Nothing is exactly what I was thinking of charging you. I felt something uncoil. I truly had no idea where I was going to go when the semester ended. You're such a good friend to me, Ginger. Truly, you're a lifesaver. You're the younger brother I never wanted and finally have. We laughed. We can work out the details when the semester is finished. For what it's worth, good luck on finals. And she hung up. During finals week, we had our last two dance classes. What are you doing for the summer? Steve asked me at the Tuesday night class, where I was the student and he was the aide. I have no idea. Why? How'd you like to interview for a job at the dance studio where I work? Seriously? I'm not that good. You're good enough to teach beginners and we always need men. More women come for classes than men. You'd have to audition with the owners of the studio, but I told them you're good enough and have the personality for it. I appreciate that. He handed me their card. Call if you'd like. It's a fun bunch and you'd get paid to do something you clearly enjoy. I looked at the card. A dance instructor? I hadn't seen that coming. There was a girl in the Thursday class where I was the aide. Her name was Karen. She was tall for a girl and was always thrilled to dance with me. After class, she asked if I'd walk her to her car. My face often gives away my feelings, and she quickly said, I've seen you watch Steve's ass when he's dancing. We're good. It's nice, right? Very, but he's a bit short for me. We chuckled. Okay, I'll walk you to your car. I really enjoyed the class, she began as we walked along the footpath to the parking garage, and I've specifically enjoyed dancing with you. I've always been self-conscious about my height, especially when it comes to dancing with a man. I wanted to tell you how much I've enjoyed the class and my time dancing with you. It may seem silly, but there you have it. It isn't silly. I've had a miserable year, and it means a lot to me that something so simple made you so happy. We reached the garage. Want to do something absolutely ridiculous? I asked. Well, that depends. Come on, I said and began running up the steps of the garage. She followed me to the top floor. That's my car over there. I had parked far away from everyone else, and the campus had been emptying out as finals wrapped up throughout the week, so there weren't many cars. Want to dance? Absolutely. I opened both car doors, popped the rear hatch, and turned up the radio as loud as it would go, just as the song She Drives Me Crazy by the Fine Young Cannibals came on. We used it in class all the time. And there, on the top floor of the parking garage, we built the happiest memory of my entire time on campus. Grades were posted. Calculus, F. Differential equations, FX. Social dance, A. Introduction to special education, B. Writing comms for teachers, A. All that remained for me to do was to pack up my things. When I got to the room, all of Ray's things were gone. I packed up my things, loaded my car, and left for Ginger's house. As I drove along the interstate, I was slightly optimistic and found myself wondering, What would come next? Epilogue It's worth repeating, all things being equal, that we all want and need to be loved, even if we may tell ourselves we don't. We want our parents to love us. We want our families to accept us. We're wired for it. We're indoctrinated into it. But that want doesn't always serve us, and we sometimes need to modify our wiring, which is a long and arduous journey. It was clear to me by 8th grade that my father didn't want anything to do with me, unless it served his own self-interests, like being cover for his affairs. After he broke what was left of my trust in him when I was 16, I consciously began to let go of my need and desire for his approval and love. By my junior year in college, I hadn't seen or spoken to him in five years. Nonetheless, his reaction upon learning I was gay was like a dagger in my heart. And an unexpected gift as it cut away any lingering hopes I had of ever connecting with him. I was finally able to truly begin mourning the loss of the traditional father-son memories I never had the chance to build, but still secretly desired. I was finally able to begin letting go of him in my heart as well as in my mind. The dynamic between my mother and I was more complicated. My father was almost entirely negative examples, but my mother was a blend of positives and negatives. As wounded as she was, she was the only caregiver in our family. As non-demonstrative as she was, she was the only source of affection in our family. And when she rejected me, I lost what positives I had in my family dynamic. 
At that time in history, more people seemed to keep to their closets than come out of them, especially in suburban America. Fear of rejection, fear of losing one's job, fear of being attacked, these were and are real and painful fears that come with equally painful consequences. I wouldn't wish what I went through on my worst enemy. The implosion of my group of friends on campus was a tremendous blow to my sense of identity and self-worth. Their friendship propped me up, and in a way created a loving and safe environment which allowed me to accept I was indeed gay. And then when I disclosed, they took my sense of safety and being loved away. I never saw any of them again after the spring semester. I don't know what happened to Ray that year. I don't know where he stayed or how he fared academically. He just disappeared, whether into a bottle, along an endless white line, or a path to discovery, I don't know. Susan, like my sister, had starved herself for the person she loved. Susan was not fat, nor was she ugly, but she felt she had to be something else to deserve and receive Ray's love. A red flag in any relationship. If you feel you need to be something other than who and what you are for someone else, I would encourage you to explore that. Is your partner doing that to you, or are you doing it to yourself? If you're doing it to yourself, do the work to find out why. If your partner is driving that message, I encourage you to do some deep thinking as to what you're getting out of that relationship and whether or not it's healthy for you. If the other person thinks you need to be something or someone else for them to love you, that is not fertile soil for love to take root and grow. You could find yourself in an endless cycle of disappointment, frustration, and shame. Often such dynamics are rooted in the history of our family of origin, and we are trying to work things out in the present with others rather than doing the work to find the source from our past. I know many adults who are stuck in this pattern. If only I can change this about me, then they will love me. If that sounds familiar, it may be worth your while to have a chat with a therapist. I say this from personal experience, not in judgment. As for Ray's poor physical boundaries toward me when he was drunk, who knows? I'd wager it was idle curiosity and nothing more. Our sexualities are a continuum within a bell curve. Few people are exclusively heterosexual, few are exclusively homosexual, and the vast majority of us are somewhere in the middle. And those in the middle are somewhat fluid as we go through life. Having an idle fantasy about someone the same sex as you doesn't make you gay any more than the reverse makes you straight. Human beings are not binary creatures, as much as we seem to wish that we were. I connected with Ray via social media decades after college. He was married with daughters of his own. He said it was karma for all the shit he'd done to girls when he was young. Now, he said, he spent his days worrying about and working for their safety. He apologized to me for not being a better friend that year. I told him we were barely more than children doing the best we could with what we had to work with. Even though we felt we knew it all, we knew nothing. It's true what they say, at least for me. The more I learn, the less I feel I know. Assuredness is for the young and inexperienced. Once after we reconnected, he sent me a cryptic message that he was a bad person and had done something terrible. I immediately reached out and asked if he needed to talk and gave him my cell phone number. Then nothing. His account was deleted, and that was that. I wonder occasionally what had happened. I thought about reaching out to his brother, but in the end, I let it go. I did what I could in the moment. He chose not to engage and I have learned the importance of sometimes letting things rest and being boundaried. Julio almost turned me off of therapy forever. I don't know the stats, but I imagine for many, a poor experience with one's first therapist could easily turn someone off the process forever. Asking me if I cruised bathrooms for sex was so off the mark and rooted in stereotype bias. Calling my morals into question out of literally nowhere left me rattled. I thought I'd done a pretty good job figuring things out, all things considered. I'm no testament to purity, but I think I did okay. His abrupt change in demeanor, coupled with the fact that he was a grad student, left me to imagine he had received a correction from his faculty advisor, who must have reviewed our session notes and intervened. On the plus side, his exchange about me being someone was a stepping stone to my finding my value, and for that, I'm ultimately thankful for the experience. I still think fondly of my time with Michael. He helped undo some of the emotional and psychological damage Pip had done when he raped me. He taught me a lot about the gay community's history. He introduced me to some amazing classic films. 
and he taught me how to kiss and how to be a good lover. I have no complaints, nor have my subsequent sex partners. If you're contemplating coming out of some closet, first do an assessment of how you would fare given the absolute worst-case scenario. What will you do if you lose needed financial support or housing? How will you respond if people you tell turn their backs on you? What resources exist to help you? Have a plan in place for the worst outcome. Be prepared, then begin. I was exceedingly fortunate that Ginger stepped in and kept me off the streets. Not everyone has that support. Be sure you can emotionally and financially survive the worst possible outcome, and realize the worst possible outcome may still be better for you than your current state of existence. No one knows your situation better than you. Only you know what is right and best for you around coming out of whatever closet you may be living in. It's very easy to be glib with saying things like, no pain, no gain, but sometimes the pain is too much. I learned the lesson of look before you leap, and it was a painful lesson to learn. This applies to many types of coming out. Anytime you have a secret, be clear about your motivations and expectations when you choose to disclose it to someone. You have no control over where that information will go next. Be strategic. Hope for the best, but plan for the worst. The outcome will be somewhere in the middle. I've had this position for many years now, and people have said to me, Times have changed. Sure they have. But cruelty and ignorance haven't gone away and seem to be gaining some momentum. The pendulum swings both ways. Your number one job is self-care. You cannot fully care for others if you aren't first caring for yourself. As for writing a letter for a major disclosure, I'm all in. It's a wonderful tool for organizing your thoughts and giving someone something concrete to hold and to read and reread if your news hijacks their emotions. When we are hijacked emotionally, our higher reasoning shuts down. A letter is a gift to someone to help them understand what you wanted to communicate. My brother's delight at the news was because he believed it somehow put him in a better position within the dynamics of our family. That he told her father and then shared his response with me was not that surprising, just unnecessarily hurtful and further alienated us from one another. My sister coming at me with scripture would have been laughable under different circumstances. I was proud of myself for having the presence of mind to call her out for her hypocrisy. And my mother, well... When I finally recover from that moment in my life, I'll let you know. To this day, I live in fear of dying from AIDS. My mother's curse etched something on my soul that I've not yet been able to erase. The spring semester was certainly transformative for me. It set the course for my life to date. I have a number of gaps in my memories from that time, such as the power of dissociation, but I remember enough. I would never have imagined taking a ballroom dance class would have such a lasting impact on me. I wouldn't change a thing from that semester if such a change took from me the memory of dancing on top of the parking garage with Karen. What a pure moment of innocence, connection, and joy. I wrote what I'm about to say after recording a draft version of this episode and listening to it several times. I said not even a minute ago from your point of view that I'd let you know when I finally recover from my mother's hateful words and actions. And it's the damnedest thing. In reliving this time and hearing me tell it, my perspective has changed. I now find myself thinking, what a gift that all was for me. It has taken me 34 years to receive that gift, but here it is. I didn't think it possible for my view of that evening to undergo such a shift in perspective. As I was listening to my story, I found myself realizing how lucky I was. In throwing me out of the house, in wishing me dead, in rejecting me, my mother put in motion a series of events that allowed me to eventually break free from the dysfunction that was my family. It was painful, gut-wrenching, and I had many dark times ahead, but I saw this gift with perfect clarity as I listened. They'd all cut cords I don't think I would have ever had the strength to cut myself and in so doing, allowed me to break free of a family paradigm I could have easily been trapped in for the rest of my life. My mother throwing me out that day shaped how I would engage with the world as a human being and as a gay man. She put me on a path I would have never chosen without her cruel push. 
I recognize how incredibly lucky I was to have had, once again, the right people intervene in my life at the right time. It allowed me to begin carving out my life for me, not for others. As I consider where my siblings are in their lives and the dynamics they continue to play out with our mother and with one another, I realize now I was not broken. I was forged and released. I am so surprised and grateful for this revelation. Getting from there to here is the tale, but I never thought I'd see that moment as a gift. Never. And yet here I am, feeling grateful for what was, at the time, the most painful and damaging experience in my life. I spent 34 years mourning the various losses that resulted from that day, and suddenly, I feel unburdened and whole. Until next time, keep doing the work, keep climbing, and remember, you are not alone, and you are not broken. Broken.